We're here at Mac Court for the Obama rally. We're waiting probably less than two hours away till the candidate has arrived, though he might have arrived already. We've been asking people three questions. Um, basically, what would you ask if you had a face-to-face -face with Obama? You know, what policy issues would you be interested in? What would be your top three things you'd want him to focus on in the first year? Treatment on demand, et cetera, et cetera. What are your top three issues? So, we've got a raucous crowd here. Matt Court is slowly filling up. Um, crowd's been well behaved so far. So, here we are. Ask your question. He'll tell you no lies. My name is Chi Seng Lee. And uh, where are you from? I'm from Albany. Albany? Okay, yep. great. Uh, what would you ask President Obama that you've not heard anybody ask before? What would I ask President Obama? Oh, geez. Um, well, I'm really interested in how he would, you know, fix America's image, you know, across the world. Uh, it's really, it's really been hurt in the past few years. And but I think he can do a lot to change it. He has a really good character, I feel. And I'd just like to know um, what he would do, you know, what he would change. So, the, America's image with? With the rest of the world in general, really. Uh, I mean, everyone's really, it's, we kind of, um, our image has kind of deteriorated with everyone, I feel. And I, I, I've done some traveling in Europe, and everyone I talk to, uh, they just ask, you know, what's, what's going on now, you know? <laughs> I mean, personally, I would ask all the questions. I mean, I've already heard them before. My biggest concern right now, personally for myself, is education yeah, reform. I mean, I so I would be asking him personal questions about that, what he plans to do, and how he plans on instituting higher education for particular students of color who um, are left out of the educational system. I would probably ask, like, what are his most realistic goals that he would put in action right when he got into office? office because I've heard like all the great things he has to say and I just like I guess I wouldn't be sure what he would do right away to help us when he got in. I guess maybe to expand on because there's a lot of talk about you know the dichotomy of in the US of like the black versus white issue and, and race and how that is um, talked about in society. However, I think there's a lot of other issues with the Latino and Asian American, the African American, and the immigrant community that doesn't get brought up really on a national level that I'd like to know more about his opinions of how to bring those communities together and how to actually uh, uh, engage them to participate um, that usually are marginal. Every president in my lifetime has not been upfront and honest with us. Reagan's Iran-Contra, no new taxes, read my lips, George Herbert Walker Bush. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Or weapons of mass destruction. I would ask Senator Obama, who's a man of great integrity and honesty and transparency, how he would manage to keep those who he surrounds himself with, how he would inspire those in his cabinet, and how he would inspire other elected officials to raise the bar when it comes to the level of, of American integrity that needs to be in the White House and that we need to see from our leadership and that we hope to see and we know we'll see in Senator Barack Obama. I would ask him what his stance on Tibet would be. His stance on Tibet would be. whether with uh, China's invading and whether it's a country or not. Why is it important? Uh, because Tibet is an important country and it's something we need to focus on. Especially because there's people there and we need to have a clear policy set out before we can get going. I'd probably ask him how would he individually help uh, maybe like our community, you know, like high school kids in general. You know, I know he's got, I know he's probably got asked that question before, but that's probably a big one for me. How is he going to help out the youth and, you know, not only in America, or here, but in America also.
So if you could ask the president one okay. thing that's the most important thing to you personally, what would that be? Are we actually getting out of out of Iraq? I see that as a money drain. I really do. Why? I originally thought I, I bought it hook, line, and sinker. I I believed what the Bush administration told us, and I felt uh, very deceived by the whole thing. I feel that that money is just going down a rat hole, and I don't see a I don't see a chance that those people are ever going to get along well enough for us to do any good over there. I think they've squandered a, a really good uh, chance to possibly pull that country back together, and I I don't see anything happening. Looks to me like Iran's ready to step in and take it over. If we pull out, I don't know. Maybe that's the best thing. I, I don't know. It, but I I do feel deceived by our government. If we can or your family. create more work better job, better pay, and if all that can come up, you can get more people to more, start worrying more about what themselves is and about what's happening around them. Because everybody's focused on themselves right now. If we can get that focus onto everybody else, I mean as a community, as a city, state, government, we can create, well we can create, we can have a better reaction, a better way of how we think about each other. I want to know what the likelihood of my kids seceding as people of color and I want to know how he's going to make it better for them than it was for me and than it was for my parents and my grandparents. That's pretty personal for me. I think just as a, like, a leader on my campus, the, the question I would ask him just like what inspires him and what motivates him and keeps him going and from being deterred of you know the many things that go on in either politics or organizing in general because I know his his background is mainly or it began in community organizing and so how that panned out and how that affected him so uh, I would ask Senator Obama and I'm quite serious about this how he would like me to serve um, shortly after 9-11 our generation was ready. It was a call to arms. Yet our commander-in-chief was hardly a commander and hardly a chief. If Senator Obama is elected, you watch. There's going to be a resurgence in a call to, and I'm not talking military arms, I'm talking a call to action. Peace Corps, uh, volunteering in the community, community organizers, making all our lives better by participating in this system. And I would ask Senator Obama, then 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, how he would best like me to serve my country. Well, I feel there's a lot of economic disparity in this country. Um, like, my parents have become unemployed in the last few years. I mean, they're working on a small business, but they're really getting killed by, like, health insurance costs. And I, I just don't think, you know, in this kind of country, that should, thing should happen. I, actually, I'd, like, I'd really like to know if he's going to try to implement universal health care. I'd like to know if, if, if what his actual plans are for that and how he thinks that's going to work. In his first year of, of office, what would the... Uh, the most important three things be that you'd like to see him address? Well, right now, because um, the immigration status is really kind of like we don't know, you mm -hmm. know, and also how the uh, country has been divided in that too. I mean, the war, the immigration. Um, I would like to hear, you know, um, more of that. Like, what is he, you know, going to do uh, the next three years uh, with people that are undocumented but yet they pay taxes and uh, I would like to hear you know um, I would like to see changes in the school you know here in our community in Eugene I mean um, I would like to see you know more increase in people of color going to school and not dropping out because they you know they have to help uh, sustain economically the family you know kids working and anyway 
I'm talking the Latino kids. I mean, I'm sure there are many people like that, you know, not only the Latino kids, but yeah, African American kids, Caucasian, so. Well, we're engaged in a quagmire of a war on two fronts, and I applaud Barack Obama's willingness to work with others uh, on both sides of the aisles uh, and bring people together to come to a common sense consensus. And in regards to foreign policy, I love the fact that the senator says that partisan politics ends at our borders. I would like to see Barack Obama fix and mend our tarnished reputation overseas. I would like to see Barack Obama engage in upping our security at our borders. Uh, Four percent of cargo being inspected is a failure in my opinion. And I would like to see him work with both parties cooperatively in a common sense, educated manner to secure the nation first and foremost without being a military aggressive nation that occupies countries for baseless reasons. Immigration. Uh, student loan debt, especially as a graduate, I'm a graduate with $23,000 and I'm going to have huge, huge interest to pay and I know that I'm not the only one here at the university or in the nation. I want him to address that as a student and as a student of color and I think I would want him to address cultural competency within our schools, not only uh, higher education but K-12 K and the idea of why so many students of color aren't going to uh, college, why so many of them are being left behind and why there's such a track within high school even though there's not claiming to be that there's no track within high school why so many of our of our students are being tracked out of uh, high school I think that the ones that have been talked about so far have been already prioritized and in, in especially in the dialogue but I'd like to see education um, the access to K through 12 and post-secondary um, that become a uh, really the the top, the top one of the top di uh, discourses and then I think maybe three other issues I think immigration is one um, one that's comprehensive and that doesn't target necessarily like the immigration community or immigrant community, um, but one that looks more comprehensive and what his policies would be about that and as well as um, I think the I think addressing disenfranchisement uh, dif disenfranchisement of student uh, students uh, marginalized communities in the voting process because I think that's an issue that most people don't talk about and that why is why is it that we only have 30 percent of the population voting and why don't we have more people participating and why is it that they don't feel included in the conversation and how do we work towards that rather than just talk about the issues that are already being um, like those that mostly vote already like how how do we expand on that and address everyone's issues rather than those who actually just vote and the reasons why people don't vote um, I am a sociology major here, so my primary thing is social work. Social services yeah. um, has declined extremely in our country um, over the past decades. We must revitalize that. We must revitalize education as well. Everyone must have an opportunity to gain that, no matter what your income is, what your color is. Um, and we must do something about the war in Iraq right now. We must do something about um, globalization and, and imperialism. Um, we have to get our troops out of there. That's, that's imperative. Um, and we've got to figure out how to get ourselves out of the debt that we're in because I'm very concerned for, for our economy, our financial situation right now, and how that's taking a toll on our societies. This is a special edition of Diversity TV. We're here at Mac Court on a full moon, Good Friday, the Obama rally. Uh, as you can hear, the crowd's warming up. Uh, the candidate will be here inside of an hour. Uh, we're doing interviews and checking out views. I'm actually from Eugene. I went, I'm a duck, and I'm glad to be back. Yes, yes. So. This is the pit, folks. We got the pit. We got to make some noise. This is the loudest arena. So let's do it. Woo! All right. So I want to thank you all for coming. This is amazing. It's awesome. Um, 
I, uh, want, first, I want to definitely talk about the amazing work that folks have been doing here in Eugene and in Oregon. Uh, the Eugene for Obama group have been organizing for Obama, getting ready for this, doing registration and things like that. Um, the students from Barack at Lane at L and at U of O have been just kicking some butt. That's good. Um, so, thank you. And now, again, we've got folks that have been registering people to vote. How many of you registered to vote tonight? All right. And how many of you changed your party registration so you could vote for Barack Obama? Okay. Um, so some things I want to make sure you all know. In order to vote for Barack, you have to be registered Democrat. So if you're not registered Democrat right now, make sure you pick up a voter registration card when you leave here and register as a Democrat so you can vote on May 20th for Barack Obama. Um, also, we definitely need your help. We got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of people to talk to. So fill out one of those volunteer cards that folks are walking around with and you can help us out. Okay, so I'm done with that. Um, thank you guys very much. Sorry, can you hear me? Good. Um, no, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so right now I'm gonna introduce uh, our next speaker, which is uh, Su Susan Castillo. She's the superintendent of education here in Oregon. Um, the first Latino woman in the, in the house, which is wonderful, and she's here again. Thank you, thank you, Courtney. All right, well, welcome to this historic night in Eugene. Woo! It is historic. Well, just like you, I look forward to seeing and hearing from the best candidate for President of the United States. That's right. And, and just like you, I'm excited and inspired that with his leadership, we have the power to bring about real change. Just like you, I'm here to support Barack Obama. Woo! That's right. I love the senator's plans for education. Senator Obama says he wouldn't be where he is today without the quality education that he received in his life and he wants to see that same opportunity for all children in our country, just as I do. That's right. So I join him. I join the good senator in saying that we need to do everything we can to close the academic achievement gap and make sure that all children arrive at school ready to learn. He calls for more investments to help our teachers get the support they need in our schools. That's right. And he wants to make college more affordable. That's right. So those of us who are here will never forget sharing this historic moment. This moment in time when we helped this amazing leader get elected to the White House. That's right. The momentum is with us but there is much work left to do. Obama is doing his part, and we need to do ours. Just like you, I feel the positive energy that's in this room tonight. So let's savor this wonderful moment, and let's keep looking and working for change. We can, si se puede, we can work for change. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And now, it is my great honor to introduce the next speaker, a wonderful congressman here from Oregon, Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Good evening. Welcome to the official start of the presidential primary in Oregon. It starts... It starts here tonight 
and it starts in the pit, right? For the first time in 40 years, the Oregon presidential primary actually matters. Aren't, aren't we glad that our legislature didn't join the parade and try and move the primary up to Halloween? Now we are in a position that if we can harness the energy in this room and do the job that we need to do, a victory in the Oregon primary can cinch the nomination for Barack Obama. Right here, right now, it starts here. Unprecedented volunteer turnout, the energy, the commitment, the drive. Anybody here know anyone who lives in Pennsylvania? Huh? Should we be emailing, calling, reaching out to them? Does anybody in this room know of somebody who isn't properly registered? Maybe in a different party. They've got a month to re-register and we can help them. It's all about our seizing this moment, our following through, our making sure that this campaign is everything that it can be. With your help, it's going to be fired up and ready to go. Thank you very much. call the pit. This is what they call the pit. How about that? I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm not an opposing basketball team right now. Wow. Eugene, it is good to be here. It's good to be in Oregon. There are a few thank yous that I've got to make. First of all, please give it up for the president of University of Oregon, Dave Fronmeyer. Thank you.
I want to thank a great supporter, Congressman Earl Blumnow of the 3rd Congressional District. I want to thank Susan Castillo, our State Superintendent of Public Instruction. I want to thank the Lane and University of Oregon Students for Obama groups. I want to thank Eugene for Obama. My two local organizers, Courtney Height and Jonathan Manton. Give it up for them. And I want to thank uh, one of my national co-chairs, a outstanding leader here in America, somebody who has devoted his life to public service. It helps that he looks and sounds like Clint Eastwood. Uh, he was a fighter pilot, a top gun, flew in the Thunderbirds, flew in Vietnam, and then ultimately became a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He is homegrown here in Oregon, and I am so grateful to have uh, his support and his friendship. Please give a big round of applause to General Tony McPeak. All right, Ducks, I know that this was a tough night for you. But, but I tell you what, you know, Illinois didn't even make the NCAAs this year. So you guys had a wonderful season. You're going to have an even better season next year. In the meantime, let's talk a little politics. Let's talk a little politics in the meantime. I, I announced I was running for president 15 months ago. Uh, I stood on the steps of the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois. The building where Abraham Lincoln served for most of his career before he went to Washington. The Lincoln is the man. I agree with that. Let's give it up for Abraham Lincoln. No, no. Why not? Love that guy. Love that guy. The city where I served for many years in state government before I joined the United States Senate, I stood on these steps and I announced this unlikely journey to change America. And I have to say, after the announcement, there were those who came up to me and said, you know, why are you running this time? You're a relatively young man. You can afford to wait. And I had to explain I'm not running because of some long-held ambitions. I'm not running because I think it's somehow owed to me. I'm running because of what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now. The fierce urgency of now. Because I believe there's such a thing as being too late. And that hour is almost upon us. We marked this week the fifth anniversary of the war in Iraq. At the outset, we were promised a six-month venture. We would be greeted as liberators. Cost us about 50 to 60 billion dollars. Five years later, after 
The price tag has gone well beyond half a trillion dollars, and people expect that it may reach as much as three trillion. After thousands of lives lost and thousands more grievously wounded, a war that has made us less safe, a war that has fanned anti-American sentiment, a, a war that has distracted us from the battle we need to fight against Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. We are at a defining moment. Our economy is in a shambles. Everywhere you go, all throughout Oregon, all across America, you hear the same stories. People's wages and incomes haven't gone up in years. It's harder to save, it's harder to retire. People have never paid more for gas at the pump, never paid more for a college education, never paid more for health care. 47 million people without health insurance, and if you've got health insurance, what's happened? You've seen your co-payments and your deductibles and your, and your premiums going up and up and up. Our education system, despite the slogans, leaves millions of children behind, unable to compete in a global economy. And now, with the subprime lending crisis and the financial institutions on Wall Street teetering, people are at risk of losing their homes, they're at risk of losing their jobs, they're anxious about the futures of their children and their grandchildren. In such circumstances, we can't afford to wait. We can't wait to fix our schools. We cannot wait to fix our health care system. We cannot wait to bring back good jobs and good wages to America. We can't wait to end global warming. We cannot wait to bring an end to this disastrous war in Iraq. We cannot wait. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. We, well, it, it, I love you back, I do. When, when, when we decided to, to, to run, it was based on the belief that the size of our challenges had outstripped the capacity of a broken and divided politics to solve. And that the American people were hungry for something different. They were tired of a politics that was all about tearing each other down. They wanted a politics that was about lifting the country up. They were tired of spin and PR and double talk. They wanted straight talk and the truth out of their leaders. In other words, I was betting on you, the American people. I, I knew that I was not the most conventional of presidential candidates. But, but, but I also understood that what had taken me to Chicago over two decades ago, when I worked as a community organizer alongside steel workers who had been laid off after the plants closed and were shipped overseas. And I spent three and a half years setting up job training programs for the unemployed and after school programs for disadvantaged youth and bringing economic development to these neighborhoods. And, and it was the best education I ever had, as hard as the work was, because it taught me that ordinary people can do extraordinary things when they're given a chance. That change, that change in America doesn't happen from the top down. It happens from the bottom up. And so, 
And so what I was convinced of was that we are a generous and a decent people, willing to work hard and sacrifice for future generations. And if we could just come together, if we could get past the divisions and the distractions and the trivialization of politics, if we could decide black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, young, old, rich, poor, that we were going to challenge the special interests and the fat cats that have come to dominate Washington, and that we were willing to challenge ourselves to be better, to be better neighbors and better parents and better citizens, then there would be no problem we could not solve, there would be no destiny we could not fulfill. That was the bet I was making on you. And I am here to report that after traveling through 46 states, after speaking to hundreds of thousands of people and shaking hundreds of thousands of hands, after kissing hundreds of babies, and eating hundreds of chicken dinners. I am here to report that my bet has paid off. My faith has been vindicated because all across the country, Americans are standing up and they're saying, we want something new. We are ready to turn the page. We are ready to write a new chapter in American history. That's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. As I watch young people get involved like never before, as I, as I see those who are young at heart you know, rediscovering the excitement of change, I would like to take all the credit. But I have to confess that part of the reason everybody's so enthusiastic in this election, why they're watching the debates and reading position papers and turning out at rallies and voting at record numbers, Part of the reason is they know that no matter what else happens, when, uh, when they go in that polling place next November to choose the next president of the United States, the name George W. Bush will not be on the ballot. <laughs> no Bush. Bush. <laughs> the name of my cousin, Dick Cheney, will not be on the ballot. Some of you read about this. This was a crisis in the campaign when the report came out that Cheney and I were distant relations. That's okay, though. His name won't be on the ballot, so we know that the era of Katrina and warrantless wiretaps, of Scooter Libby justice and Brownie incompetence and Karl Rove politics, those days are coming to an end next year. But, but you know what, you're, you're not here just to be against something. You know, you're here to be for something. It, 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 you know, it's easy, it's easy to, to, to be against stuff. It's easy to complain. It's easy to feel cynical. It's easy to feel bitter. What's hard is to, to make a decision that we still have it in our capacity to join together and, and, and make this country work. And work not just for a few, but work for the many. Not just for the top, but the middle and the bottom. That we can still create ladders of opportunity for all people and, and make sure that upward mobility is not just a myth, but is a reality. And, and that our middle class is strong and prosperous and that we are 
thinking about the next generation, and we are good stewards of the environment, and we are good partners in alliances for peace and prosperity beyond our borders. That's, that's why you're here. Because you can imagine something better than we've got right now. But it's not easy. It's not easy. We've got to work for it. We've got to work for it. There's a reason why people feel cynical, because they, they feel like their voices have not been heard for so long. They're not heard on Wall Street. They're not heard in Washington. I hear them because I'm traveling across the country. I'm talking to people. And, and I meet, you know, the young woman I met who, who has a sick sister. Her sister has cerebral palsy. She's got to support her sister. So she's going to school full time, full course load. She is determined to get her degree. She goes to school, comes home, takes care of her sister, does her homework, gets to bed at 10. Then she wakes up at 1 o'clock in the morning and starts out on the night shift, working for FedEx, taking packages out to airplanes. She gets three hours of sleep a night. She's not looking for a handout. She is determined to live out her American dream, but she doesn't understand why it is that Washington seems deaf to her asking for a little bit of help. A, a little help on her student loans, a little bit of help taking care of her sister. Her voice is not heard. The voice, the voice of the worker who has worked 20 years in a plant, suddenly it gets shipped overseas and he loses not just his job, but his pension and his health care. He wants to be heard. He wants to feel like somebody's not giving him a handout, but giving him a hand up. Working to, working to knock down some of those barriers so that he can succeed, live out his American dream. The veteran who I meet from Iraq or Afghanistan who's proud of his service and rightfully so because our veterans have performed magnificently. They have done everything that has been asked of them. They have performed brilliantly on behalf of this nation. General McPeak talked about, General McPeak talked about being commander-in-chief. And as your Commander-in-Chief, my job will be to keep you safe. That will be my first priority. And I will do what's required to keep you safe and to keep my nine-year-old and six-year-old daughters safe. I won't hesitate to strike against those who would do us harm. But keeping you safe starts with maintaining the finest military in the world, and that means training our troops properly, and it means equipping them properly. It means putting them on the proper rotation so that they're not going on three or four or five tours of duty. It means caring for our troops when they come home. No more homeless veterans. No more begging for disability payments. No more waiting for hours to see a doctor at the VA. They have earned our respect and our honor, we have to serve them as well as they've served us. But it also means using our military wisely. That's the essence of being Commander-in-Chief. That's what General McPeak was talking about, judgment, wisdom. Well, the, the honesty. The, the, when that 3 a.m. call comes, what you want is somebody who will get all the information, who will analyze it, not through an ideological lens, but analyze it based on practicality and common sense and, and weigh the dangers and, and weigh the costs and weigh the opportunities and will listen to advisors and will be straight with the American people about the choices that we face. That's the answer you want from the Commander-in-Chief if they get a phone call.
Not fear mongering, not trying to act tough because that's the politically smart thing to do, because it's the troops who end up having to pay the cost. It's the American people who end up having to pay the cost. Using our military wisely, there's no more profound obligation of the Commander-in-Chief. And the war in Iraq was unwise. We have three candidates left for the presidency of the United States. One of them recognized this was a bad idea. That's who you want answering the phone call at 3 a.m. in the morning. The war in Iraq was unwise, and I was opposed to it in 2002. I will bring it to an end in 2009. And don't be fooled by the argument of, of a precipitous drawdown. Nobody's being precipitous. We have talked about bringing troops out at a pace of one to two brigades per month. At that pace, it would take us 16 months to get our combat troops out. That, that is potentially two years from now. That is not precipitous. This war has lasted longer than World War I, World War II, and the Civil War. Two years from now, it will have been seven years. If we cannot stabilize Iraq in seven years, we will not be able to stabilize it in 15 years. We will not be able to stabilize it in 21 years. We won't be able to stabilize it in the hundred years that John McCain is talking about. But if we send a signal, we're not going to be an occupying force. If we remove our troops carefully, as careful getting out as we were careless getting in, if we initiate the humanitarian aid that the Iraqis so desperately need, ordinary Iraqis, if we set a timetable to force action, among the Iraqi factions. If we are initiating diplomacy, not just among our friends like Saudi Arabia and Jordan, but also Iran and Syria, we can then refocus our attention on going after those who killed 3,000 Americans, bin Laden and his cohorts who have a safe haven right now in the hills between Pakistan and Afghanistan. We can start putting our troops on decent rotations. We can take some of that money and invest here in the United States of America to build a strong economy that will ultimately make us safer and deal with the homeland security needs that have been neglected over the last seven years. And we will be able to go before the world community and say, America's back. America's back. America's back with diplomacy. You know, we have three candidates left running for president. One of them has said he will meet not just with our friends, but with our enemies. Not just with leaders he likes, but leaders we don't. John McCain didn't say that. Hillary Clinton won't do it. George Bush mocks it. But I remember what John F. Kennedy once said. He said, we should never negotiate out of fear, but we should never fear to negotiate. That's what strong countries and strong presidents do. They talk to their adversaries. They tell them where America stands. They try to resolve differences without resort to war. Nixon met with Mao. Kennedy met with Khrushchev, Reagan met with Gorbachev. That's what American foreign policy is. We use our military when we have to, but we also understand the power of diplomacy. 
And when we do that, the world will once again look to us for leadership. Leadership in locking down loose nuclear weapons. Leadership in helping poor countries build schools and, and dig wells and deal with HIV AIDS. Leadership that brings an end to the genocide in Darfur. Leadership, leadership that restores, restores our sense of due process and, and human rights and, and civil rights. We will close Guantanamo and restore habeas corpus and end renditions. Because, because you will have a president, you will have a president who has taught the Constitution and believes in the Constitution and will obey the Constitution of the United States of America when I'm president. That's the vision of what is possible. That is the America that we should be building right now. But, you know, remember what I said, it's not going to be easy. When I started this campaign, we knew that the status quo would resist. It always does. Not just Republicans, the status quo within the Democratic Party. We get comfortable too. We start getting those contributions from the lobbyists and the special interests. We start liking our positions of power. We start getting lazy. We stop listening. We become more distant from those we claim to represent. It happens periodically in the history of this country. And then our citizenry, we, we, we become divided, we become distracted. And, and, and we've seen that happen for so long now that we just think that's normal, that that's what politics is about. I gave a speech this week about race because of some excusable, because of, and, and, and it was prompted by an immediate controversy in the form of, of my former pastor who had said some inexcusable things and I found out about them during the course of this campaign and then during the last couple of weeks and I condemned them strongly but what I wanted to do in that speech is, is explain that this is just one more way that we're distracted. This is one more way we're, we're divided. This is one more reason why we can't come together to solve big problems in this country. But it's not the only division we have. We're distracted by all kinds of stuff. We're, we're distracted by all kinds of things. We're distracted by an immigration debate that's more about politics than solving the problem. We're distracted by, you know, you know, we're distracted by arguments about, uh, about gays as if, as if that was the source of our economic dilemmas or our national security problems. We're distracted by the, the trivial back and forth and the petty bickering among our politicians. We're distracted in so many ways. And what, what, what I tried to, to talk about this week is we're all, we're all a little guilty of it. I, I feel myself slipping into it sometimes. But, but that's not how we're going to move this country forward. We are going to move this country forward because we recognize ourselves in each other. Because we decide for all our differences, we have more in common. Because we know that every American loves their country and believes in opportunity and wants a fair shake. If they're working hard, they want to get paid a living wage and, and, and they want to health care for their families so they're not bankrupt if they get sick and they want to send their kids to a good school 
even if they're not rich and they want to retire with dignity and respect and they want to be safe from harm and they want an environment that we that, that we can pass on to the next generation that's what so many of us want that's what is at stake in this election and so we can't afford to be distracted this time not this time this time it's going to be different this time we're standing up and insisting that change is possible this time we are going to put aside fear and we are going to reach out for hope this time we are going to turn out like never before and we're going to vote at record numbers this time we won't be turned back by racial division we won't be turned back by social hot button issues this time we are going to stay focused on creating the kind of America that we want for our children and our grandchildren. And if you are willing to stand with me, if you're willing to hope with me, if you're willing to struggle and fight for me, then I promise you this, Eugene, we will not just win Oregon. We will win this nomination. We will win the general election. And then you and I, together, we are going to change this country and we are going to change the world. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you.